well, at the beginning, I need to tell that I'm not a theologian, I'm a sociologist. So I'm looking at the issues uh, from a sociological perspective. So I may be talking about sociology of Islam, but not, um, uh, not um, the theology of it tonight. So, um, my question at the beginning will be, does Islam encourage violence? If I ask this question to you right now, this evening, I do not, I do not know how many of you would think uh, and say yes. Um, but a recent Pew Research Center study uh, found that 46% of Americans think that Islam is more likely than other religions to encourage violence. So it's um, a big percentage, I think. It's 46% in December, uh, two months ago. The question, however, seems to be no different from are Asians smart? I like this question especially, uh, indeed, and I use it to test my students' ability to perceive situations and circumstances in a wide context. That is what we call sociological Im imagination. I asked them, uh, why do you think that Asians are smarter than Hispanics? And their responses find my pressing uh, follow-up questions until they realize that uh, there are social dynamics shaping our perceptions, uh, not the best and brightest com coming to our southern border, um, coming from our southern border, uh, but uh, the Asian immigration process is quite the opposite. Uh, we've got their best and brightest to issue a visa. So, uh, my first question um, to you would be, which country is the most populous Muslim-majority nation on Earth? Okay, yes, Indonesia, yes, okay, great. Uh, so, um, so, you did your homework. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so it may be a challenging question to those Americans who would think, uh, who would be in that category, uh, 46%. Uh, they might be thinking about Islamic, so-called Islamic republics, right? Islamic Republic of Iran, and the Islamic Republic of Saudi Arabia, and, and now there is another Islamic state. So why they do need such Islamic title for legitimacy? So it means that, you know, you should be really skeptical about their Islam. Because they need to use that Islam as, as the, you know, for, for the market uh, purposes, it seems. So, you know, probably people would think that, it, yeah, it may be Saudi Arabia, or it may be Iran, or it may be some other nation, but no, it's Indonesia. Another, another interesting question might be, what is the percentage of Arabs uh, among all Muslims? 18%. Around 18%. So 80% are not Arabs, and 18% are uh, Arab Muslims uh, on earth. So when someone makes a strange link between Islam and violent behavior, he or she needs to find answers to questions like why do we have less radicalization among Muslims in Indonesia and Malaysia, whereas radicalism is abundant in failed states? and fragmented societies in the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Africa. If Islam is the root cause, why don't we see it everywhere? That's a straight sociological question. When we ask, does Christianity encourage violence, it is crystal clear to us how problematic our imagination of two billion people in one box, that vari their varieties of faith, their faith, their diverse form of life under different regional circumstances and regime types. And even domestic variations across race, age, uh, culture, and class could be, could be coming to our mind right away. But when it comes to Islam, it's not that much clear. When something is unknown, it's easy to demonize. When some people are seen as alien, it's easy to dehumanize. Now let me share uh, Republican presidential candidate Ben Carson's latest remarks. Uh, American Muslims who adhere to Islamic Sharia law while also embracing American values of democracy must be schizophrenic, he said. That's his word. So 
uh, American Muslims who adhere to Islamic Sharia law, while also embracing American values of democracy, must be schizophrenic. So his definition of Sharia just reminded me, oh, this is ISIS definition of Sharia. That, yeah, this is what ISIS tells, tells us. It's widely shared among ISIS supporters uh, because uh, that perspective uh, is essentialism, I call. There is only one brand of Islam, one type of interpretation, one unified ideology that, could, that should commend every human action at each moment. And often this is a violent one. So both Carson-like individuals and ISIS supporters share, this, share the same definition of Sharia, which is against our democratic values. So if we ask this question now, does Islam compatible with democracy? I'll, have, I'll share some thoughts tonight and, and, and um, uh, looking forward to your questions. Um, when we think, let's put these two categories. Uh, can, is, can Islam be compatible with democracy? Because this is Ben Carson's point of view, as far as I understand. American values cannot be compatible with Sharia. So that, that, that's Sharia. And you know, this is also, it means that Islam cannot be compatible with democracy. That's uh, one of the frequent arguments uh, in this thinking. So when we compare religion and a political system, we should be aware of some problems at the beginning. Uh, some, uh, some issues uh, about the analytical uh, perspective. Uh, but we could, we could do uh, somehow, because Islam uh, could be um, speaking about the everyday interaction and democratic values, you know, it, th there should be some comparison, uh, that's fair. So, uh, but democracy is a system that evolves and that is being continu continu um, constantly developed and devised. And so if we are talking about the ancient Greece democracy, you wouldn't like it, and, right? You know, uh, people, uh, everyone is equal, but who is everyone? Who, who is defined as citizen? Uh, well, not women. <laughs> okay, so it's not everybody equal, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean anything in your definition of everybody, right? So these are problems that we, that we always struggle, uh, even our, uh, our age. Um, um, so, Islam's worldly aspects could be comparable, as I said, because Islam has some unchangeable dimensions in philosophical uh, world as a religion, uh, like uh, fundamental uh, principles that orient uh, the perspective um, uh, and you know these faith issues I mean um, believing in one God and, and, and so forth but these very values could be applicable uh, in our definition of Sharia so when we, sh when we put the word Sharia uh, it's not the Sharia that I I look at in Saudi Arabia or Iran, I need to look at the <clears throat> principles of Sharia. So primarily equality, one God and one people. You know, there are some philosophical perspectives. Uh, or I need to say this as a paradigm. You know, this faith paradigm have, uh, has some values. Like, let me just give one clear example. You know, when Quran um, talk to people, often the case for, uh, for such uh, equality and other principles, democratic values, pluralism, um, it's all people. Yeah, and you have nafs. It's not all Muslims. It's a kind of you know, call for all people, so not making a division in, in its, um, its discourse, you know, the, these verses um, itself. So, um, Islam's um, Sharia it, it cannot be approached uh, from one perspective of um, uh, one single uh, issue is defined in, uh, in one way. Instead, uh, there are um, broader principles 
uh, that needs to be in the in the picture first, and then the debate uh, debate comes second. So, what are these principles? There are some fundamental ones, uh, such as the uh, prophetic tradition, uh, when Prophet Muhammad said, "You are all from Adam, and Adam is from Earth. O servants of God, be brothers and sisters." So, uh, those who who were born earlier, or having more wealth and power than others, or belong to certain families or, or, or ethnic groups, have no inherent right to rule others. Uh, so maybe primarily it was the reason um, that the Sunni Shia divide. Uh, Prophet didn't talk about specifics about how, she, how the society should be governed. He could tell that after me, you know, uh, my lineage, you know, my uh, my kin uh, or my tribe or my family, you know, these lines should be the governing. Uh, go governing um, the body and, and so forth. No, he didn't tell all these details. Uh, maybe we, at that time they thought that this is detail, but it, it became a big problem for them because uh, they had different philosophies, especially Shia said it should be by blood, prophet's blood, and that blood lineage should be important. And we need to think that the religious leaders, those who are coming to prophetic uh, lineage, family lineage, as the religious authorities at the same time. So political leadership and religious leadership came to become one leadership in Shia. So it's more Catholicism here, if you will, in terms of, in terms of what? In terms of having the religious authorities, having the political say so in, in public. It's more Catholicism, I said. No, indeed, in terms of the Sunni Shia divide, it's more Protestant at the beginning because they were protesting. They were the ones who were going against the majority, right? You know, they were protesting it. But, you know, what they made, what, how they understood along the way, the political institutions should be the same religious institutions under uh, a leadership, um, the same leadership, uh, make it more uh, different than the Sunni one, which is uh, more Protestant in thinking. You know, there is Quran. And uh, there is you, and there is no authority between. And that is, uh, there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages, of, of course. You know, there are some uh, pros and cons. What are pros? Okay, uh, it is you and Quran. No authority between. Um, means that you have an ability to make the cultural issues and other issues, having a way to come to Islam, shape Islam. So you can have an American Islam, because the principles are the same, but you could work on the details. Quran gives you that, you know, that open space for you. And so that there is no political definition of Sharia in which, you know, uh, often the case Iran and Saudi Arabia, oh, you know, we are just talking about the family inheritance issue. Or, you know, uh, the thieves, they sh we should cut their, you know, hand, hand or no. I mean, these are really trivial things. You know, Sharia, primarily, freedom of speech. What is the freedom of speech in Saudi Arabia or Iran? You know, that, that would be my first question. You know, this is the fundamental Sharia principle that you need to have first and foremost. You know, it's more like, for me, American Constitution. You know, we debate over Constitution. You know, which one should be coming where and why and in which setting. Yes, you know, this is the way that, that Sharia needs to be understood. But, you know, uh, should we talk about in this discourse? This is another question, maybe in our question and answer sentiment. Myself, as a Muslim, uh, I don't think that we need to revive that Sharia discourse. I mean, democracy does it for us. American Constitution is enough. Because we can talk about freedom of speech and other things, the principles, in the, within this discourse, without you know, going to political issue and politicization of the issue, because it goes to trivial issues that is nonsense. It's just you know, making, the, making all, you do, you know, uh, I guess, the principles of Sharia uh, undone, it, uh, because it became too much politics in it. You don't have religion. There is no space for religion. So, and you know, there is a new book on this, a wild halak, one, one, one full book, uh, which argues that the uh, Sharia cannot be revived under the conditions of the modern nation state. So it's over, he says. It's over because 
you know, you put Sharia uh, under the nation state, which penetrates in the modern time uh, in, in a strong way to, to our uh, private sphere that makes uh, all these issues politicized too much. And so, you know, uh, there is no uh, healthy debate in the Sharia debate uh, in uh, empires and, you know, other, other times, earlier times, we didn't have that much, you know, nation state, uh, state's rel relationship with, with, with the individuals and, and so forth. This is a bit uh, philosophical. I just don't have time to go into that debate. But there is one full book, Wal Hallaq's new book, uh, on uh, the title is The Impossible State. You know, this is an impossible state under the modern nation state conditions because what happen, happens when some people, majority ruling country, comes and takes Sharia as the constitution and go against the rights of minorities. This is against Sharia, but they do it. They do it because of the political reasons. And so, you know, this is dangerous. And, you know, they do it not because they are Muslims, but because the nation states, um, uh, the modern nation states, um, uh, relationship with the uh, uh, with the with the people and also the definition of citizenship in the modern times, uh, and I I've uh, taught uh, a couple of times uh, revolutionary revolutionary movements around the world, and there is one book talking about why we have so much radical movements, revolutionary movements in the 20th century, and the answer it's Jeff Goodwin's book. Um, the answer is uh, it's primarily because we have a more strong nation state that penetrate uh, private spheres of individuals and politicize many issues and then uh, the relationship, uh, that kind of relational dynamic, uh, especially in the early 20th century, uh, a kind of top-down state policies made, uh, made uh, many radical movements uh, emerging, and especially exclusivist and basist uh, policies uh, he refers to. Anyhow, uh, I will be concluding uh, my final remarks will be um, about the um, about the uh, democracy's uh, principle that overlaps with the Islamic principles, Sharia principles. Uh, one is uh, justice and rule of law being essential. Um, so, in many times, this is so important so that the Islamic lawyers, those who uh, made the Sharia law for the modern-day Muslims, they were jailed um, for a long time. And four big, you know, names, uh, jurisprudential, you know, imams, great imams, they were all jailed and imprisoned because they were against the political authorities at their time. And these were Abbasi Empire. Umayyad Zephyr. So in the fourth caliph, in the first fourth caliph, um, we didn't have um, uh, sultans or empires of Islam, you know. Uh, but after Ali, after the you know Islam's being uh, you know a major um, major power in the, in, 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 on earth, uh, you know, it was only few decades after, indeed, you know, a close, you know. Um, uh, chapter of history, indeed, it became easily uh, sultans and uh, caliphs, those who claim to be political authorities, but also trying to use religion, politicizing religion. But Sunni Islam was a bit safe than the Shia Islam because they say, you know, these authorities are not the same authorities that need uh, that we need to obey for religious matters. So it was kind of mind and heart issue, I would say, for for majority of Muslims because they were saying, that, okay, I go to my Sufi or you know some other you know uh, you know their religious leaders anyhow, uh, but they are not the political authorities. Uh, so uh, the political authorities need to obey because we 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 need some uh, you know some form of um, sustenance and and the reality of the politics. So we, we need to choose uh, the, the best one among all these worst type of politicians. They are all bad, but we need to make it you know, our best for our political choice. So uh, it was a kind of, you know, their, their mind at times were with the, with the regime, but often the case, uh, these people, great imams, 
they, they were uh, imprisoned. And uh, what are the imams, great imams today? Where are these great imams today? I'm just asking you, for the Sunni world today. Saudi Arabia's imams, they're paid by the Saudi state. And, and others, I mean, for Iran, Iranian case, it's Shia. It, it should be, you know, political Islam and, you know, religious and political authority. It should be overlap. For, for Iran, I, I cannot ask such a question, but for Sunni Muslims, I can ask that legitimate question. And when I, it's okay if I ask that question, but it would be dangerous if someone living in Europe and having problems, um, psychological or social problems, being excluded from, from the majority of the people, these youngsters I mean, uh, when they are called for um, uh, understanding the Quran and there is no authority between. So all these sheikhs and imams and others, they are paid by the Saudi state who are violently doing all sorts of non-democratic things to their people, and they are often seen as supported by the West. It becomes really a problem for these youngsters. Um, they are vulnerable to the radical message because there is no authority, as I said, in between, and there are cons for this. Um, there are some issues uh, with the uh, failure of uh, the Islamic authority in the modern age. Um, I'm sorry, I was thinking that it should be 15 minutes, but uh, I hope that we have some time for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you.